Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for being here for what is an exciting day and the first part of an exciting day. And I appreciate everybody getting out here, relatively speaking for us, early um, for what will be a series of fascinating and hopefully inspiring um, opportunities to share what some of our teachers are doing on, the, on this campus that are really transforming the lives of, of our students and impacting student learning in really effective ways that hopefully we can share and network across the campus and across our disciplines. Um, my name is Richard Freistadt. I'm the director of the Center for Teaching and Learning. We co-host this event with the Academic Innovation Studio, with Educational Technology Services. And as I was thinking this morning about sort of this event, I for some reason started thinking about the Avengers. I think maybe just because the commercial is on constantly and how like everybody seems to love a good origin story. Um, our origin story is not going to be an action film, but we do have an origin story. Um, and I really wanted to quickly just give people a little bit of background. This event started two years ago, so this is our third time running this event, and it started because faculty kept saying to us more and more two things. Number one, we want more opportunities to sit in a room together face to face and actually talk about teaching. And number two, when we talk about teaching, they tend to be these very abstract conversations because we have no idea what actually happens in our colleagues' classrooms. So to try to address both of these kind of questions and, and, and opportunities, the event was inaugurated two years ago as, as the Waves of Innovation, and we solicited faculty from across campus to showcase innovative things they were doing in their co courses to inspire others and share ideas. It was a fa fantastic event, and it, I love our Berkeley faculty because the one piece of feedback we got afterwards was, well, I was going to share something, but what I do really isn't innovative, so I wasn't included. So we had to change the framing of it and to say innovation and reinvention because it is all valuable things to share with our colleagues. Even if it's something you've done tried and true for 20 years and you've tinkered with it, you've toyed with it in some way, refined it to be something that is effective, that is worth sharing with colleagues. And sometimes those are the most important things to share. So the event is now the showcase of teaching innovation and reinvention. This is the second year we've run it in this type of iteration. The first two hours will be a series of lightning talks from faculty across, across campus talking about some of the interesting things they do pedagogically, the concrete practices themselves. Then in the afternoon, we'll have some lunch. We'll have an opportunity to hear from this year's Distinguished Teaching Award recipients. And to close out the day, um, Angie Stacy, our, our Associate Vice Provost for the faculty, will be moderating a panel talking about producing equitable outcomes for student learning in the classroom. Um, I would be remiss if I did not also put in a plug quickly. You will hear throughout the day and in the second hour in particular, a couple talks specifically related to digital teaching and learning, which is a very important emerging topic on the campus. Um, the Center for Teaching and Learning runs a summer program called the Digital Pedagogy Fellows run by Dr. Rita Marie Conrad, who is in the back. She'll also be the timekeeper for the day, so she's easy to find. So if this program sounds interesting to you at all, or if you have questions, find Rita, talk to her, send her an email, um, or just email teaching at berkeley.edu, and we will get that information to her to get you that information. Um, my last thing I will say is that each hour-long sort of panel of lightning talks or panel discussion will have a moderator as well. I think we've lined up a great group of four moderators today. Um, we will close with Angie Stacy. Before that, for the DTA panel, we'll have Oliver O'Reilly, who is the chair of the Committee on Teaching this year, next year who will be the vice chair of the Academic Senate, moderating that panel. The 11 to 12 panel will be Serena Chen, who is a professor in psychology and the chair of the Undergraduate Teaching Collegium. And to kick us off today, our moderator will be Jen Stringer, who is our chief academic technology officer and assistant vice provost for teaching and learning. So I am um, thrilled, actually, to uh, moderate this lightning panel. And I'm not going to take up your time, because what we want to do is hear from all of the folks who are on the panel and who are giving our lightning talks. Um, but I will say that to um, Richard's point, and now he's got me thinking about Avengers, and next time maybe we'll come in capes and, um, and have, I don't know. It, it's a thought. But, um, but what, I would, what I would say is, is that every time faculty members get into the classroom and they get in front of um, 
our students, it is sort of you're using your superhero powers. You are using your powers of your ability to communicate to graduate students and also to undergraduate students the love of your discipline and how that they can become, um, you know, they can grow um, in, in their academic progress. And so I think as we put on our superhero capes and we think about our superhero powers, some of that other thing is, is sort of sharing it amongst each other so that we will be sharing our superhero powers amongst the day. And with that, I am going to go ahead and kick off the first talk, which is Haitham Mohammed, who is in Near Eastern Studies. And he's going to talk about the topic, creating envi an environment for less commonly taught language classes. So. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me and um, giving me the opportunity to um, share my experience with um, teaching Arabic and um, also sharing the term less commonly taught languages. So how many of you know the term LCTL? One, two, three, four, five. So we don't know what is less commonly taught languages. Me neither. I didn't know that before. But. <laughs> <laughs> because it's a term that was invented by the American government to talk about the less commonly taught languages in schools, which would be any other language than English. You know, so sometimes you find some languages put in this category that are used humongously around the world, like Chinese, Arabic, Hindi. Yes, they are used around the world, but are they being taught? No. So they're still less commonly taught languages. So it can vary from these um, languages that are kind of interesting and like, you know, around the world, very well known going down to the dialects or languages that are being spoken in Africa or even like Finnish or Swedish or like, you know, Scandinavian languages. It's kind of this array of um, different languages. So if we are talking about less commonly taught languages, what would be the first problem that would kind of pop up that we're going to start thinking of, especially that it's not being taught in school? What would be the first problem? What do you think? Huh? Having Teachers, resource. OK, so having teachers. What else? The students. What else? Having students hear language going on. Thank you. So it's the environment that would make this language grow. OK? So this is the problem that I was kind of tackling here. But also resources. You're not finding enough resources, and sometimes these resources are kind of pricey to find them. Also, if you think about it, this is a language that is not being taught in the US, maybe not spoken that widely. So who would be the student who's targeting this language? Who would be? Either a heritage student or a second generation like, you know, they grew up in a household that speaks the language, but they don't use the language, they don't speak the language, so they want to connect with their heritage and whatnot. And then, at the end, at the bottom, would be those who may be interested in some of these languages, especially if they are called the critical languages, that would be pointed out by the government that <coughs> we need people to learn these languages because these languages are being used, like Arabic, Persian, Chinese. OK? And this will bring us to something else. When we are teaching these languages, the teaching or the style of teaching would be kind of targeting specific goals. That's it. It's just for them to communicate limited communication with whoever the uh, people who are using this language. So I will move on. This is some of the problems that students do not have enough practice. This is one of the things also that students, yes, they are learning the language. but. OK, they spend an hour in the classroom, four times a day, four times a week, five times a week, three times a week, depends on whatever. But outside of the classroom, do they use it? No. Which is kind of disencouraging to students. The students feel like, why am I using that? Unless they have their own goal, their own target. Then um, there were some kind of treatments that kind of uh, suggested, and some many people kind of use it. I'm not the first one to use some of this, but I kind of use some of the combinations 
that are being here, uh, either by bringing guest speakers, bringing in guest speakers, or field trips. If we have something, we have a lot of communities around here, especially here in Berkeley, we're lucky. <laughs> Honestly, there's a lot of diversity here. So you have different communities where you can have, make some kind of field trip, and this is one of the, the things that I used. And then we have realia or performance, where you bring in students um, to make them, ask them to do some projects where they're using the language. Some of the results, this is one of the things that I made, which is a visit to the halal market or the place where they sell the um, um, Middle Eastern uh, food. They had an activity, they had like something, a target that they had to, to, to do, which is finding out like, you know, three different types of cans and give me the name if they know it, if they don't know it, they hear about it or not. And the result was amazing because at the end, the students had to talk to the person who's selling and they have to ask him three or two questions just to make sure that they uh, understood or whatever and then I kind of evaluate what they did. So quickly this was, um, this was my uh, presentation about this idea of involving student within the community. Of course I'm here uh, if you have more questions or you ask about something else. Thank you so much. And I should have said the way we're doing these lightning talks is we're going to get through them all. If we have time for questions at the end, we'll go ahead and bring folks back up. But otherwise, we'll have some times for breaks and that kind of thing to ensure that um, folks uh, have a chance to ask questions and reach out to um, any of the speakers that you have. So with that, we've got Sarah Emery from Biology who's going to talk about Bio1B Flipped Fridays, Integrative Active Learning into a Large Lecture Course. <laughs> So just very quickly, I am not a faculty, but I'm speaking about a project that we worked with Dr. George Roderick on, um, who is the faculty teaching this part of the course. Um, and special thanks to him and also the entire Bio1B development team and Jennifer Imamura, who also worked on this project. And so just to give you a little bit of background, this is a large lecture course for undergraduate students, introductory biology, 600 to 700 um, 750 um, undergraduates, attendance is not required, and three faculty actually split this course into thirds. So the section that um, we worked on was just the section taught by Dr. Roderick this spring, which was the ecology section. And so our goals here, and this was really um, initiated by Dr. Roderick, who is interested in, in how we can incorporate some of these um, some of these ideas into a large course. And I think a lot of these ideas are often used in smaller courses and um, yeah, seem a lot easier to use in that context. So we wanted to increase student engagement because this is a feeder course to a lot of biology majors. We wanted to facilitate equity and inclusion since there is scientific background that um, these, these sort of uh, active learning um, ideas really do uh, help in that area. And we needed to create some creative solutions to incorporate active learning in this large lecture, uh, lecture format. Um, and we also wanted to build science identity and introduce students to the published justification for why we're doing this. So we had four Fridays in this third of the course. Um, and first, Dr. Roderick wanted to identify things that either weren't covered well uh, in the book or that students traditionally struggle with. Um, and then we created some pre-lecture uh, video content for the students to watch ahead of time to sort of introduce them to the vocabulary they needed. Um, and we really wanted to help them with graph interpretation and expose them to, um, expose them to published material um, and make sure that students are sort of getting that background. But more than anything, our goal here was to build knowledge and engagement throughout the lecture. And we did this um, a few different ways, or we tried to anyway. Um, we wanted to incorporate some hands-on activities. So one of the ones we were able to, uh, to do this spring uh, in our section on disease was we passed out a red and white cardstock to students in this whole lecture course. And then we uh, had students sort of model um, how disease spreads for a couple different diseases with different characteristics. And they, there was a video of the classroom, so the students could sort of see the disease spreading throughout the classroom um, when the disease had different characteristics. And that worked pretty well, I think. Um, and then we also did some think-pair shares. Um, and 
since the course was so large, we did use the tool of iClicker Cloud so that students could sort of enter in these, um, these short answers and then produce a word cloud that Dr. Roderick could facilitate a discussion um, around the responses. And then it was also really important for us to facilitate accessible connections to scientific inquiry. Um, and we did this in a couple different ways, but one of the ways was we brought in um, a lecturer who's a prior uh, graduate student in Berkeley, but also did part of his undergraduate here in our um, climate change, uh, our module on climate change. And he came in and was able to talk about this huge project that he worked on and sort of his trajectory um, as a scientist um, and really show students that there is sort of a pathway for them to talk to, talk to professors um, and get involved in different kinds of projects. And I think they really liked that. Um, and then we also used iClicker Cloud to, um, uh, in our section on biodiversity, <laughs> to build a whole set of data that we could then talk to students about and incorporate in and talk about different measures of diversity, um, alpha and beta diversity oh. and Shannon diversity index. So we were able to use this sort of in a novel way. And then we were looking at the outcomes in two different ways. Um, and we really haven't looked at this exam data yet. We'd like to split it between students who are present in class, which we can look at through their um, through signing into iClicker um, and students who are absent. This is just the raw data. And then we also did, ooh, this didn't show up quite right. This is supposed to be an arrow. <laughs> um, but uh, COPUS data, which is just a way of looking at what is the instructor doing and what are the students doing throughout class. And so you can just see on the bottom here, students and lecturers are doing a lot more different things in these active learning classes um, than they are in the control lectures. So with that, thanks. <laughs> Next, we have uh, Amelia Barilli, who teaches uh, Spanish and Portuguese. And she's going to share with us um, her topic on teaching 21st century competencies through authentic assessment pedagogy. I brought a handout, and I will leave them in the back. It's just one page, um, double sided. So, um, we are facing a big challenge, um, and as our colleagues have already mentioned, it's a problem of um, intrinsic motivation of the students to remember what they have learned. Um, this is such a generalized problem that there is even a book about it that's called, uh, well, several books, but uh, one of them is New Education, How to Revolutionize University to Prepare Students for a World in Flux. And this is a book by Kathy Davison, which is an expert in education and Professor Acuni. And so um, the problem is that, um, for example, she refers to a study where students have taken a, a test and passed it in the fall. They are given the same test in the spring and they flunk it. <laughs> and we also have um, many courses in which students, they are sequential courses, and uh, I mean, when I say we, I'm talking the profession in general, uh, where students are preparing one course and then they move to the next course, but they are not able to transfer what they learned from the previous course into the next one. So it's a real, real problem. Um, <clears throat> The problem is that students don't remember because they are not intrinsically motivated to learn. Uh, the way we assess them, uh, they pass the grades and the, the, the tests and the essays because they want to pass the course, but not because they want to remember. And uh, we need to somehow foster that intrinsic motivation. Uh, the problem also is that the students don't see what they are learning or the way they are being tested as relevant to their life today and the needs that they are going to have when they graduate. And um, that is because we are, in many cases, still teaching uh, for 20th century uh, competencies, which were more about recall and recognize uh, foundational knowledge, uh, demonstrate recalling through tests and essays, um, amass knowledge individually, if working in groups, recirculate that knowledge, and then follow the teacher instructions for a grade. But those 
competencies are not the same that we need today. Those competencies were developed for the industrial age, but then came the information age, and now we are in the concept and innovation age. So the 21st century competencies are more understanding as transfer, problem solving, innovation in new contexts, uh, given that uh, the students often um, have to not only transfer the knowledge, but apply it in a framework that doesn't fit the same framework that was presented to them through foundational knowledge. Uh, collaboration in groups to discover new knowledge, communication also through uh, multimedia and virtual spaces, uh, self-assessment skills, super important for today's world, and intercultural citizenship, how to work together with people from different backgrounds. How can authentic assessment pedagogy help us to meet this challenge? Authentic assessment is a form of assessment in which students are asked to perform real-world tasks that demonstrate meaningful application of essential knowledge and skills. Uh, Grant Wiggins defined it as understanding as transfer. And this is a, an anecdote that he uh, was a soccer coach. I mean, he, Grant Wiggins is the author of Essential Questions and also Understanding by Design two books that I highly recommend if you haven't seen them yet. Um, and he says this um, anecdote that he was a soccer uh, coach and was telling the, was drilling the um, students in soccer uh, skills. And then um, when they went to the game, they couldn't remember and apply the drills. And so he was saying, use it, use it, you know, the drills we had done. And they said, well, but you know, the others are not aligning in the same way that we had in the drills. Um, <laughs> So think of assessment more as information for improving. The tasks not only um, serve as direct measure of assessment, but also as vehicles of such learning. And you may say, well, OK, and so how are you applying this? Here is a traditional assessment, selecting a response against performing a task, narrowly defined context against real life, etc. But I'm going to skip because I'm seeing that I only have 30 seconds. <laughs> and I want to tell you <laughs> how I applied it. And so, for example, I teach a course at uh, Borges, Buddhism, and Cognitive Science, where students uh, learn about uh, principles of Buddhism and of Cognitive Science. Borges is a Latin American writer that was also interested in Buddhism. He wrote a book about what is Buddhism. So they, um, to understand better these concepts about that thoughts and actions can actually change our brain, not only they write academic blogs, but they interrelate to the uh, articles and videos and then see it, how it's present in their life, but they actually design an experiment where they uh, choose a trait, a negative trait that they would like to overcome, and then they design an experiment where they are observing you know, when the trait arises and how to how do they usually feed it in their usual reactions and how to stop it through deep breathing and then plan something new. And this kind of understanding of mental processes uh, makes them much more interested also in the characters they are studying and even in the uh, nuances of Berkeley's style of uh, how, it's not Berkeley, Borges' style <laughs> about presenting these complex pro pro processes. So my discovery is that if you get the students interested in something that's relevant to their lives and to their uh, longer understanding, then they will remember the next time. And if we change, Okay, I need to go. <laughs> if we change the way we assess, what we assess and how we assess, and it's also going to change our pedagogy and we are going to be engaging the whole student, not only the brain, but the heart, the hands, and uh, then they are going to uh, remember in a lifelong, lifelong learning style. Thank you so much. I was actually thinking that grocery shopping at an Arabic um, uh, grocery store is sort of an application of real life, and I'll bet the students remember um, that experience as well. Um, next, we have up um, Jessica Walker from American Studies, and she's going to talk about race and the digital food life. Good morning, everyone. Um, and good morning to whoever in the future is seeing this. Um, so I'd like to start with um, kind of the issue, the image on your left there is Mediterranean-inspired elote, which is Mexican corn, traditionally done um, with uh, mayo or white cheese, um, paprika or chilies, but in this taste-made video from the UK, done with yogurt, um, chives, and red peppers. So 
the context of this is the whole kind of debate about cultural appropriation that pops up from these taste made videos that are, if anyone has seen them, kind of disembodied hands making meals out of context. What follows is um, uh, on a website about kind of Latinidad and Latin American culture is an argument about the stakes of this type of appropriation. So people talk about shame, they talk about how this angers them, this is an uh, insult to their tradition, that this is a regional kind of mismatch. What are people from the UK telling us about um, our traditional elote? So where does this conversation end about cultural appropriation? Who does food belong to? But importantly, what are the terms, ideas, and feelings that people use to claim that belonging, that culinary ownership? My work is on food studies and foodways. We know you can follow any foodway and get somewhere. So finding where something began and end, ended is hard. But the terms that people use to describe that belonging is more important to me. I wanted to apply this idea to the problem of race and studying food. It's usually done in an additive way, where you have, say, a course on American foodways, and there's an ethnic uh, week or a race week. But what about the process of race, using critical race theory to understand how race is actually a sign that can change um, uh, how food, uh, food stuff belongs to people or doesn't. The traditional example I give is um, the fortune cookie that we usually think of as Chinese, but is actually Japanese. Why? Uh, because Japanese were locked up in internment. The Ch uh, Chinese came in and took, their, took over their bakeries that sold fortune cookies. Now it's Chinese. This thing happens over and over again in American foodways. So I wanted to um, kind of capitalize on what is a growing conversation in food studies from history, uh, economics, American studies, ethnic studies, to these digital foodstuffs that I think are food um, images that I think our students are consuming a lot of. Um, and so how can we apply, I think there's an opportunity here to really to help students synthesize racialization as a process and digital literacy. So the tools that are being made to construct this digital image and these terms of racialization. Um, my plan is to develop two case studies. One is the elote mishap, and here is the Whole Foods collard green mishap that happened a few years ago, where Whole Foods uh, tweeted out a picture of collard greens um, with peanuts in them. Um, black Twitter went off, um, again, using the same types of terms, shame, tradition, economic disenfranchisement, so on. So my learning goals are really to help kind of students define racialization first, which is a big thing. It's probably one term that's used um, that we're going to look at throughout the semester. Um, and also these three kind of um, uh, key points of digital literacy, access, analyze, and evaluate the media itself. Where did it come from? Who's writing it? What are the terms used to describe um, this foodway tradition? Um, I would have these available through my personal website, which is yet up. Um, and I would like to get feedback from kind of food studies colleagues this summer <coughs> in a conference. Um, so again, if the Whole Foods peanut mishap or the elote mishap, um, you can really, I can understand case studies as both in-class activities that help us understand kind of the access issue. Um, and when I say access, I mean the actual design, food design. So most of the food we see is like not edible, right? It's heavily designed, with has plastic in it and all that stuff. Um, what is the outlet itself? What is the kind of audience response, the content, the ads around the site? Um, Facebook screenshots, Twitter screenshots, all of those things are used. Um, when I want folks to analyze something, it's the message and the meaning. So how are they constructed and ma manipulated? Um, I want students to engage with the production of the digital uh, piece itself. And uh, finally, to evaluate and cr critique, um, and possibly also create their own video and response. Um, so what is the actual message that connects race to food, and can we kind of figure out a rubric almost for seeing racialization or the process of racialization in these very um, discrete digital formats? Um, so here would be some of the primary sources we would work through maybe in one class section, and I'm thinking of pairing one term with one um, article. So basically really trying to break those digital literacy um, mechanics down. Thanks. Um, so we have another uh, talk about um, uh, biology and I think um, uh, making it more interactive for students. This is um, Jules Winters and she's going to talk about points does not equal participation. Can we compel students to voluntarily respond to digital clicker questions in class? Thank you. Um, so I'm Jules, I'm in the Integrative Biology Department, and I oversee uh, Biology 1B, a large lecture course, uh, which Sarah gave a wonderful introduction to if you saw her talk a couple minutes ago. 
So Biology 1B is a large lecture course. Um, as I also want to emphasize that I say clicker in quotes throughout most of this talk, and that's because we actually use multiple student response technologies throughout this course. We actually use three different softwares. So I'm just going to say clicker generally, but it could apply to any number of different softwares. Um, the course covers ecology, evolution, organismal biology. We have a lab and a lecture component. Um, lecture meets three times a week at 8 a.m. So how many people teach 8 a.m. large lecture courses in here? A few people. Um, participation, attendance is always a challenge that we have to face. And um, that is one of our major challenges. Um, here you can see our uh, attendance over two semesters, um, which has a steady drop as the semester continues. So that was one challenge that we were facing. And another is we have a very diverse background of students with their um, understanding of the material coming in. So this figure on the bottom, we're showing how what level of exposure students had to biology before arriving in Biology 1B. Um, we just asked them this was self-reported. And two points that I'll uh, show you here is we have this first bar, that's, if you can't read the legend, that's for one high school course. So one high school course in biology is about 35% of our students have had one high school biology course before coming to Biology 1B, while 60% of our students have had AP biology. So that is a huge dichotomy in experience into coming into this course. And so we're constantly having to keep in mind um, you know, what level of breadth and depth we want to use within our content and how we can help the students who have less background be able to um, you know, uh, achieve, achieve the learning goals that they have for themselves. So this, these challenges created an opportunity for us that we would be able to increase the student engagement within lecture, primarily so that we can help create a fostering learning community for all the students with various backgrounds. Um, secondarily, if it's able to increase the attendance, then that's a bonus. But with this approach, um, whether it was conscious or not, you know, um, Amelia's uh, authentic assessment really comes into play here, where we had a choice if we wanted to have these, in order to engage, we realized we wanted to include clicker questions. And we had the opportunity to decide, do we want to do this for points or not? And we wanted to have an experiment of having it be voluntary and seeing if students would participate because they felt compelled to do so, because they wanted to be part of a learning community and they wanted to be able to self-assess, as Amelia emphasized, is so important in this day. So um, our, our focus was to have high frequency, low risk self-assessment for these students. So high frequency, every lecture, and then low risk, no points associated with it. And so that's our opportunity for students to be able to self-assess and identify how how well do I understand this content before they're getting to the midterm and realizing it's a little bit too late, potentially. Um, so our execution, sorry, I want to emphasize that after trying this for multiple times, these are some of the tips that I have towards how this can work, um, towards having voluntary participation and have um, a large number of students participate. So the first thing is prioritize student costs. So um, we were lucky enough to have a lot of pilots so that we could actually have it for free or up to $7 maximum for a student um, cost, and if the students don't have to pay that much, they're much more willing to participate, as you might imagine. Um, we Another priority is to discuss the value of clicker participation with students. You should do this early, and you should do it often. Um, here is an example of some of the compelling language that we would use um, if, you know, just some examples. We're emphasizing that you're able to connect to the professor through this technology. You're able to connect to your fellow learners. Um, you will get a better experience out of this class by participating and also emphasizing the ability for them to self-assess. Um, you're welcome to watch the webcast as needed, but I expect you to be here participating. I expect full participation. You're setting the expectation, but it's not associated with points. There, that's, you know, you're still making it very clear. Um, we also limited the question and answer availability as our last emphasis. So the question, this is one example of a clicker question that we used. This wouldn't be shown on the projector while the students are participating. Um, it was only shown after they participated. So then, um, you know, it helps reduce the activation energy so that it's not for points. I don't need to pull out my clicker because I don't need to um, participate. But um, if it's not on the projector, you're just sitting there otherwise. And so you're like, okay, I'll pull it out. I'll participate. Um, I'll be engaged. So we hoped that some of these tools would help move them towards engagement without saying, 
you need to have you need to do this in order to get a point. Um, so this animation didn't work, but the y the x-axis shows um, over time, and the project outcomes showed that we um, this is percent respondents over semester. So on the y-axis, so of the students in the room. We had up to 85% of the students participating in clicker questions, regardless of not having points. You can see it went up and down throughout the semester. One thing that's encouraging is that it actually um, started around 85%. And as you saw, our lecture attendance went down, but we ended around 85% also. Um, and so on average, we had about 75% participation across the semester on these. So some pros of this is the students aren't um, having a lot of tech complaints throughout the semester. If it's not required, if it's not for points, they're not going to complain if they can't, if the software is not working. Um, we also like to hope we're getting more authentic responses. Uh, we've heard, for, you know, in, in a context where there's points associated, students might just be hitting A, B, C, D, whatever, as long as I get the points. Because I got a point to participate, I'm sitting here, whatever, no, whatever thing I choose, it doesn't matter. Um, we're hoping that they're more engaged because they want to engage. We're hoping it's helping to encourage attendance. If students aren't present, then they're watching it on a webcast. They're kind of missing out. They feel like they need to, um, they can start coming to lecture to engage with their community. Um, I'll also lastly mention that uh, with our the four Fridays that we had flipped, we had up to 85% on average participation. So that's really encouraging that um, as we include more active activities in our lectures, we're going to have more um, participation in these clicker questions, and it's a valuable tool for students to integrate and learn together. Um, the cons certainly uh, lower sample size. Uh, we don't have 100% participation. And um, I'll lastly put in a pitch that there's a conflict if students do have to pay for the software. Um, and uh, I know that ETS and uh, the Center for Teaching and Learning are trying to have a clicker technology that's available to everybody. And I think that that's really well suited for our campus and helps create a platform for instructors to use this towards more active approaches in the classroom. Thanks. I also want to point out that there was a really fascinating, engaged um, dialogue on TeachNet about um, how to figure, how to, uh, how to engage students at, a, at 8 a.m. large lecture classes. So if you are not on TeachNet, um, grab somebody on the, in, in the room. We will tell you how to get on TeachNet. It's an engaged conversation that is a listserv and where um, all of you practitioners can actually ask each other questions. And so that was a fascinating one. It was perfect. And did you reply to that? I think you did. Yeah. So, so again, this is about using our superhero powers and, um, and changing the world for the better, or at least changing pedagogy and educational practices. So um, on to the last one, which is Lloyd Goldwasser, um, a taxonomy of group work. And you're in the Department of Education, School of Education. Lloyd. OK, so it's interesting that you can list a lot of potential benefits of group work. <clears throat> But when you talk with most people about their actual experiences with group work, you'll find very mixed reactions. There's a lot of frustration among both teachers and students. Uh, one of the recurring bugaboos among many is that you often have some students in a group who are very engaged, working hard, and others who are just not contributing very much at all. Some group work turns out very well. And so this raises the question of what's the difference between productive good group work and unproductive group work. And this is the question that made me think about trying to create a taxonomy, uh, um, not for the sake of categorizing things, but to try to understand what's important, what factors affect the quality of group work. So the goal isn't to find a universal solution, but to have tools for thinking about how to design group work effectively, given a particular context, given a particular set of goals, given a particular classroom full of students. So this is what I came up with. Uh, um, I put a variety of factors into different clusters, and all of these seem worth thinking about and taking into consideration. Uh, um, and then for each of these factors, there is a range of possibilities. And just asking what possibilities might there be encourages, encourages you to think about other ways things might be done beyond what you've already seen. 
So we can open up each of these factors and look at possibilities. Here's an example for assessment and grading. This is within the accountability. Uh, um, you can see for grading, for instance, there are many ways of involving students in that process. For assessment, there are different ways to balance uh, uh, the importance you place on the group process, the mastery of the content, or the product that the group has come up with. Uh, um, within actions, there's a whole bunch of different ways that students can contribute. Uh, um, the more ways that their contributions can be part of the process, the more avenues of participation they may have. Uh, um, I like to use peer review because it lets students wear both the teacher and the student hats, and it lets them see the thinking among their classmates, different ways of thinking. Uh, um, and another example, uh, um, among group composition, so this highlights the possible role of co-learning, the sorts of dynamics and interactions that you might think are desirable, and whether the instructor believes that students learn best by working with uh, classmates who have common strengths or who have con uh, con contrasting strengths. Uh, um, and if that bugaboo about d students being participating at different levels here, so we can sort of at least diagnose it as a great deal of heterogeneity among the goals that students have. And then when you think about that, then you can ask about what you might do about that. Uh, um, so I wanted to do more than just a description of whether something works well or whether it doesn't. I want to identify what it is about a particular factor that contributes to learning, what aspect of learning does it contribute to. So I drew upon Alan Schoenfeld's framework, Teaching for Robust Understanding, or TRUE. Uh, um, he calls these the five dimensions that are necessary and sufficient uh, uh, for characterizing what it is that happens in powerful classrooms. So here are the big ideas, the intellectual coherence, the disciplinary practices. Uh, uh, here's the productive struggle, the balance between students uh, um, uh, thinking deeply, not being lost at sea, and the others as well. Um, so we can apply each of, each of these dimensions to the factors in the taxonomy and try to evaluate how much each of these might contribute to each, each of these dimensions. Uh, um, so for instance, we can see if you're talking about uh, um, trying to match students with uh, <coughs> roles that play to their existing strengths or develop new strengths, then that's going to have effects on the cognitive demand. Uh, um, if you're trying to give students agency, authority, identity, ownership, then you're going to pay attention to how much students uh, play a role in defining their own, their own roles that they play. Uh, um, and I have the message to stop right here. <laughs> Thank you. Which actually left us for a couple of minutes um, of questions. So the way I, I'd like to do this is, if you have a question, um, raise your hand, and then whoever it is uh, who is uh, being addressed, if you could come up just for the sake of getting this on capture, um, either to a microphone here or to this microphone. So th are there any questions for our panelists? Yes. So Lloyd, we're going to ask you to come to the microphone, repeat the question, and then answer it. <laughs> Thanks. So, so the question is, how to make that work, peer review, yeah. peer review in, the, in the sense of making, making the feedback constructive, not just, oh, that's wonderful, or uh, um, part, part of that is modeling. Uh, um, part of that is being very explicit about uh, this is what is helpful, uh, uh, encouraging students to think about will this be a help, what kind of feedback would be helpful for me since I want more than just this is wonderful. I, I actually want some guidance or suggestions. So can we have the biology folks come up here? And this is the live mic. 
So the question specifically is basically, how do you get the students to do the pre-work before they come into a flipped lecture? And if you guys can respond on, on mic, that would be great. <laughs> um, so I guess uh, this is the first time we've tried this, so I'm not sure if we have great assessment around how many students watched the videos ahead of time. I will say, as the person creating the videos, I was trying to find content that was engaging. And if something was, you know, um, a person getting a PowerPoint and that was the only way to get information across. I was trying to limit that to like a two minute section of a 10 minute video. Um, yeah. Do you have something else to I'll say? Just, I'll just add that we, we posted it on B courses and we sent announcements and reminded everybody to watch it before they came to lecture. The <laughs> um, question was what other technologies we use beside, um, in, in the umbrella of clickers. And so we use learning catalytics, which is associated with the Pearson textbooks. Um, and we learn, we use Top Hat and we used iClicker Cloud. And I'm happy to talk to anybody about the pros and cons of any of, of all those. <laughs> but just a comment, in within the context of a single semester, we only used one technology. Mm -hmm. So this is over different semesters. Yeah. That was over six different semesters we used those three. Did you prefer one over the other? <laughs> The question was if we preferred one over the other. They all have benefits and non-benefits. Um, so the learning, learning catalytics has um, a lot of wonderful um, question types. You can have students draw graphs. You can have them um, really engage more directly with so many different questions. I find Top Hat and Clicker Cloud limiting in their focus on multiple choice and also their focus on grades. Um, like that you have to say if the question was right or wrong in order to like move on to the next question and stuff, which was not helpful in our approach. So we, um, so personally, I like learning catalytics. I think any of the three are really valuable tools for trying to engage your students in the classroom. Thank you. Um, so that's it. We're out of time. But I would like to thank all of our presenters. It was actually a fascinating lightning round. We'll have some time as we switch over to the 11 um, AM hours. So please feel free to come up, ask additional questions, that kind of thing. And we'll see you back here at 11 o'clock.